Right, and that's 50 pounds worth of lottery tickets purchased, and luckily it all gets drawn tonight, so we'll find out the results of whether I managed to win money in just a few moments. Some legends are born, some are made. Some legends, however, forge themselves by spending hours next to lottery ticket machines, printing thousands and thousands of lottery tickets with a burning passion into their heart and a desire for profit. Today, we learn from this legend. Ladies and gentlemen, that's right, we've got one heck of a video today as we're going to discover how to always win the lottery. You see, you might think this system is perfectly balanced with no room for exploits whatsoever, but what if I told you there were many ways to guarantee effectively endless money? So without further ado, we're gonna dive into this video, so make sure you're sat back, relaxed with a nice warm cup of Yorkshire tea in hand, and if you're feeling especially fantastic, then you can even like the video now. Let's begin. Lotteries provide a chance for the average Joe to make Mega Millions simply by buying a ticket. It's a game of pure chance, which can instantly turn ramen-eating retrobates into caviar-crunching courtesans. There's just one problem. For every one caviar cruncher, there's about a hundred million financially destitute individuals who have absolutely nothing to show for it. But what if I told you lotteries weren't actually a game of chance? What if I told you that with the right skills and knowledge, the lottery doesn't just become a game that you can exploit and beat. It becomes a totally broken system that guarantees a hefty payout every single time. Dozens of people over the years have found loopholes to cheese their way to fortunes large and small, and today we're here not to only just celebrate them, but to learn from them. And of course, to make sure we avoid their mistakes. You see, that's the Spiffing Brit guarantee. We can exploit anything and everything. So let's begin with a humble tale. Meet Meet Jerry and meet Marge, owners of a corner shop store in the tiny town of Everett, Michigan. Like most tiny shops in America, these guys sold lottery tickets. In fact, whilst they could also sell beer and cigarettes and all of that other good stuff, it was the lottery machine that was their real profit maker, as it was interestingly the only place to buy lottery tickets in the entirety of the town. But suddenly, when a new kind of lottery became available in town, Jerry saw an opportunity to make even more money. Enter win Fall, a very simple $1 lottery ran by the Michigan Lottery. Here's how it worked. You picked six numbers, one through 49, and then the Michigan Lottery drew six numbers at the end of the week. If you got six complete correct guesses, then congratulations, you won the jackpot, guaranteed to be at least $2 million. If you guessed five, four, or three of the six numbers, you would win, but of course, a much smaller amount. Now these smaller amounts are where the real money was found to be, particularly in the event of a roll down, which was one of this lottery's many unique gimmicks. A roll down occurred if nobody managed to win the jackpot for a while, and the jackpot managed to climb above an astronomical five million dollars. And as long as there was no six number winner, remembering the odds of this were incredibly slim, then the entire jackpot amount flowed down to the lesser tiers of winners. So suddenly the five dollar prize for matching three numbers correctly became fifty dollars, the prize for matching four numbers correctly became one thousand dollars instead of one hundred dollars and the prize for matching five numbers jumped up from two thousand five hundred to twenty five thousand dollars now here's where the lottery devs evidently could have done a little bit more qa testing because despite the fact that the prize money in the total pool had effectively jumped up ten times the bar to enter was still only one dollar and crucially the odds of matching the numbers has remained exactly the same you're still picking six numbers from one to forty nine and remember, just buying one ticket essentially enters you into all of these different odds at once. There's the chance of getting three numbers correct, of getting four numbers correct, of getting five numbers correct. Sure, of course, most tickets would have no matching numbers, but if you had enough tickets, then enough of them would have three matching numbers, or four matching numbers, or even five matching numbers, to massively offset the amount that you've spent on getting each individual ticket. From a simplified perspective, it basically meant that each $1 ticket would, provided you bought enough of them, on average return $1.20. Now, a 20 cent return doesn't sound like a lot, but what if you were to buy a lot of tickets?
tickets. And at this point, it is just a law of averages, meaning you are almost guaranteed a 20% gain on your investment almost immediately. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, all these talks of odds and winning the lottery have got me thinking, what are my odds of actually winning the national lottery in my country? Well, in fact, we might even be able to win the Euro Millions, which is a lottery for the entirety of Europe. Now, of course, this must be an absolute walk in the park, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's on TV all the time, so the odds must be easy. Ah, right. So we have a 1 in 139 million odds of winning the jackpot, which by that point, I probably have better odds running for Prime Minister and actually getting it than I do of winning the lottery. But then again, I am a smug British bastard and I'm incredibly lucky. So let's enter with my lucky numbers of 6, 9, 4, and then 20. That's right, it's 69, 420. And then final lucky star numbers of 6, 9. It's the perfect lottery pick. Oh god, I'm gonna win nothing. Anyway, my intention is to buy exactly 25 pounds worth of Euro Million lottery tickets with just randomly generated numbers, because let's be real, your own personal numbers have just as much a chance of winning as random lucky numbers. I do also love how horrifically predatory this entire website is. Like, legitimately, it's a nightmare land. Like, everything is advertised as a dream coming true, and that's right, all of your happiness can be fulfilled if you only give us 25 pounds so that you have a 1 in 131 million odds of actually having those dreams come true. But there we go, that's 25 pounds worth of Euro million tickets actually purchased. Next up, we have to get something with slightly better odds. Say hello to the Thunderball game. Now, this only has a 1 in 8 million odds of actually giving us 500,000, which is actually much better. We even have a 1 in 600,000 chance of getting 5 grand. Of course, that's not going to happen at all, but hey, we're gonna do it anyway because the tickets are also cheaper but still they are completely negligent the statistical probability of us being able to even cover the 50 pounds that i've had to spend here is pretty much one in a million in itself but nonetheless i'm a british bugger and if i know anything about being british it's that we're naturally more lucky than everyone else and that means that even though i don't believe in luck i do believe in my own stupidity right and that's 50 pounds worth of lottery tickets purchased and luckily it all gets drawn tonight so we'll find out the results of whether I managed to win money in just a few moments. It's time to get back to breaking the lottery. Now, the first time Jerry played after he noticed this, he bought 2,200 tickets, which of course cost him $2,200. He had a good handful of three and four matching numbers, but of course no five matching numbers, and his winnings added up to $2,150. So that's a $50 loss. Oh no, Jerry, what an absolute disaster. But Jerry was undeterred, because he of course understood average odds and and expected returns. For example, it's time to get a little bit mathsy. If you roll a dice six times, you're probably going to get a weird mess of numbers, despite it technically being a one in six chance for each one. You might get a couple twos. Heck, you might roll three six times. That's not an even spread. But if you roll that dice 6,000 times, then you're probably going to get a much more even spread. Roll it 60,000 times, and the results will be remarkably close to the statistical one in six probability of each. This applied to Jerry's model too. His mathematical prediction in his first attempt wasn't wrong, he was simply thinking too small. The more he played and the more tickets he owned, the more certain his odds would become. So the next time he played, he spent $3,400 on tickets, and this time, Jerry won $6,300. Well done, Jerry, that's an 80% gain. That's very nice. The next time this came around, he bought $8,000 worth of tickets and won $15,700. That's almost a doubling in returns. That's an even better job, Jerry. Now we're actually getting somewhere. So things are going swell for Marge and Jerry. The only thing that could knock them off their winning streak was if someone managed to win that six-figure jackpot, cancelling out the roll-down winnings. Whilst it was definitely not exactly likely to happen, it could. And in situations where it would, you'd pretty much lose almost all of your original investment. And oh no, it looks like this did actually happen to them once. And it was when Jerry even convinced his kids to go all in. Ah, bad job, Jerry. I don't think they're going to be coming over for Thanksgiving. But eventually, to command even greater volumes of money in organizing his playing, Jerry actually founded a company called GS Investment Strategies LLC. Now, that's a bloody mouthful, so I think for simplicity's sake, we're going to call it Jerryco. Now, Jerry sold shares in his own company at $500 a piece so that he could generate money to buy tickets, and he ran his lottery winning strategy like a business. Remember, Jerry technically here, even though he's 
set up a company was doing nothing illegal. There's nothing criminal about buying lots and lots of lottery tickets. With each new roll down occurring, Jericho made $40,000 in profit, then it made $80,000 in profit, then suddenly it was making $120,000 in profit. With money now flowing up and down the town, Jerry thought he and his investors of Jericho would now be set for life. Unfortunately for him, the Michigan Lottery would shut the game down in May 2005, citing low ticket sales, which probably meant that they were not making anywhere near as much money as they wanted. And heck, it was probably Jerry stealing a huge amount of cash from them as well. So despite making vast fortunes in just a matter of months, it looked like he'd sadly have to return to selling beer and cigarettes again forever. Until he received a tip from out of state, and his lottery playing life would go into a whole new direction. One day, Jerry's phone rang. He was informed by a previous investor of Jerry Co. that a brand new kind of lottery has opened a few states over in Massachusetts. Say hello to Cash Windfall. It was very similar to the Michigan Windfall, with a few changes. Tickets have doubled. They now cost $2 each, but you picked six numbers from 1 to 46 instead of 1 to 49, and the jackpot rolled down when it hit 2 million, not 5 million. So there were still fantastically huge amounts of money to be won, so all that master exploiter Jerry and his wife Marge needed to do was regularly make a 700 mile round trip through Canada to buy the tickets. Oh god, Jerry why? But how did Jerry and Marge even stay awake on their 700 mile trip? Well they used the Spiffco XL tea mug. That's right, it's huge, it's big and you can even slap the roof of it and see just how much tea you can fit in this bad boy. Jerry didn't know there was another group, much closer to the home of the lottery, with even more youth, more energy and more pep than the 67 year old convenience store owners. You see, at MIT, where some of the greatest minds mingled, a student named James Harvey had also worked out that buying a $2 lottery ticket would essentially net you $2.40 if you played it enough times. So he and a group of friends convinced 50 people to cough up $20 each for a total of $1,000, and they all bought a huge amount of tickets. On their first game, they won $3,000, making a tidy $2,000 profit. With this success, James partnered with electrical engineering student Yurang Lu to help amass even more players, some of whom, of course, at MIT, were fantastically well-funded. <laughs> Nepotism. <laughs> In the end, they set up a company. James created Random Strategies LLC, and these bad boys were buying $600,000 worth of tickets every single roll down. Not only did they have far more resources than Jerry and Marge, they also had more time. Over at Jerryco, they got themselves a computer to pick numbers at random for him. The MIT students, however, picked them by hand. This was a way to ensure that there were absolutely no duplications in the hundreds of thousands of tickets they were purchasing. This naturally increased their profit margins even further. This took them weeks to do, but if there's one thing we know about students, it's that there's nothing they won't do for something that's free, especially if it's literally free money. Interestingly, this wasn't the only university-based shenanigans going on. Elsewhere, a medical researcher called David Zhang over at Boston University noticed the same exploit, and immediately he founded the Dr. Zhang Lottery Club Limited Partnership. Ah, now this bad boy was buying between 300000 and 500,000 tickets in every roll down too. But still, Jerry and Marge were making their 12 hour trip every roll down to buy increasingly larger quantities of tickets. Their biggest wager was buying 360,000 tickets, netting them almost $1 million of winnings. At a cost of 720,000, a cool quarter million dollars of profit is certainly impressive. But then, a new exploit was found. The entire premise of this lottery exploit hinges on the fact that the lottery climbs to over 2 million so that a roll down can occur. This boosts the value of the prizes at all of the lower tiers, which is what we're actually aiming to win. But impatient and money hungry MIT students thought, well, why wait? Why hope for a roll down to happen when I can create one myself? So days before the next draw, when the jackpot sat at 1.6 million, they bought an astonishing 7 
700,000 lottery tickets over three days, spending a total of $1.4 million. The roll down was triggered by them buying so many tickets in such a short space of time, but as it was too close to the draw of the lottery to let all the players know, neither Jericho or David Zhang had any idea that a roll down was happening, and so they didn't buy any tickets, meaning the MIT team alone was able to take $2.1 million home, a whopping $700,000 in pure profit. So ladies and gentlemen, it's that secondary moment you've all been waiting for as we discover just how much money I won on the National Lottery because, you know, I'm incredibly lucky. And despite the fact that it was a 1 in 136 million odds that I'd actually be able to win the jackpot, ladies and gentlemen, I can declare I did not win the jackpot at all. No, I won uh, 10 pounds and 60 pence, meaning I lost 40 pounds. Woo! Wow, that's like an entire weekly shop um, down the drain and I feel completely void on the inside. Yay! <laughs> but don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, even though I lost 40 pounds, all I had to do was dream big and play small. If only I just dreamed bigger and desired to win harder so that I would then gamble more, then I would have been able to win um, as it's all about dreaming. So... <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't play the National Lottery. Don't play any National Lottery. Your odds of winning are ridiculously small. Instead, find dodgy international lotteries where your odds of winning when the game reaches a quadruple rollover might actually be above 0.001. Then you never know. Well, let's get back to the people who managed to do this a fair bit better than I. By mid-2011, enough people had been exposed to the story that journalists were starting to poke around. And in July of that year, the Boston Globe published their reporting, complete with interviews from Jerry, who was now disgruntled with the MIT students for effectively knocking him out the game. So yes, he was a little bit of a salty man. With the publishing of that article, a public outcry began. How could big investors like Jerry and MIT students and David Zhang take away money from the literal lottery players? Governors around the states condemned their actions and dozens of outlets ran the story. The Massachusetts Inspector General even started an investigation against them. Cash windfalls and Jerry Coe's reputation had been dragged through the mud, and at this point it seemed clear who the real villains were. Then months passed, and the inquiry found that there was really nothing that wrong with the whole operation, at least not with Jerry and Marge. As we've always said, there's nothing illegal about buying lots and lots of lottery tickets, and Jerry and company weren't taking away money from smaller players. Cash Windfall's lottery didn't work like that. The big players had not crowded the small players out of the game or reduced their chances of winning. Every ticket still had the same chance of winning, so Jerry was actually being perfect perfectly morally neutral. As the report specifically stated, that was indeed perfectly balanced. To quote it, no one's odds of having a winning ticket were affected by high volume betting. When the jackpot hit the roll down threshold, cash windfall became a good bet for everyone, not just the high volume bettors. It was only the MIT students who would secretly and deliberately force a roll down which cut out smaller, less informed players from potential winnings. This was bad. It's not good, it's not fair, so bad job MIT. MIT students. But in fact, the simple strategy of buying hundreds of thousands of tickets and guaranteeing a return, uh, maybe it was good. Having spent $40 million on lottery tickets, 16 million of that actually went to the state in taxes. The full report is actually available to read. It's quite fascinating. I've put it down in the description and it details all the different tricks Jerry and the others used. So ultimately the states benefited in a huge amount of taxes. The little man, whether he knew it or not, probably benefited from increased odds of return and Jerry and all of those around him managed to become fabulously wealthy. Ultimately, after all the publicity, Cash Windfall Lottery ended in 2012, and after that, Jerry and Marge would play the lottery no more. They'd grossed nearly $27 million from nine years worth of playing the lottery in Michigan and Massachusetts. That's right, $27 million. And guess what? They just made even more, because they've sold the rights to their story, and it will actually be coming out on Paramount+, Plus, starring 
Brian Cranston, and even Annette Benning from Captain Marvel. That's right, you're gonna see a film on this bad boy, but we made it first. So ultimately, yes, this is a lesson in determination, a lesson in chance, and a lesson in extracting any loophole you see fit. Whenever you enter into something that looks like a game of chance, remember there are always odds underpinning them. Take a roulette, for example, a classic game of pure chance. You've got a 1 in 38 chance of getting 35 times your bet, but you also have a 37 in 38 chance that you'll lose your bet entirely. Yes, if you play a few times, you might come out with a massive profit, which is great and very lucky, but play it out a thousand times, and the statistics of those odds mean you will always come out worse. This is called the house edge, and it exists for every single game. You can look it up, it's very interesting. These sort of small mathematical margins underpin almost all random chance games, which turn a profit from casinos to pachinko machines and even loot boxes. You may win or you may lose on a small scale, but unless your game is designed by the Michigan Lottery Association, the house always wins at a large scale, and the players always lose. Except on that one fateful day when Jerry discovered that he was born a winner. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen, this has been a fantastical look into effectively how to always win the lottery. These types of situations with lotteries and other gambling space scenarios do actually still exist in the world we live in today. Many of them are just simply not talked about or hidden away or just so stupid sounding that no one would ever discover them. But they exist and they're out there and maybe after watching this video you might go and discover some of your own. The moral of the story is to always look at the odds of something before you do it because that way you'll either know if you're almost guaranteed to lose over time or guaranteed to win. But yes, if you enjoyed today's video and you like discovering more exploits that exist in the world around us, then why not consider subscribing? That way you get notified as soon as we discover some wonderful game-breaking exploits. And uh, we actually have some coming up, a few for YouTube, which are absolutely broken. Want to know how to increase your viewership by over 400 times? Well, um, we found a way. <laughs> So yes, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have an absolutely lovely day, my friends. As always, of course, a massive thank you to each and every one of our amazing patrons whose names are listed on screen now. Look at these majestic sausages. Thank you so much for your generous patronage. And if you sat there wondering what video you'd like to watch next, look no further than this one on screen now, hand chosen by myself to be absolutely perfect for you. Anyway, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have a lovely day. And of course, goodbye for now.